We continue in our sermon series in the book of Hosea, and this morning we come to Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 through 23. Hosea 2, 14 through 23. If you're using the Black Pew Bible, you can find that on page 752. But I ask that you now listen carefully, for this is the very word of God. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Accor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal, for I will remove Remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, You are my God. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, reveal to us through your word and the preaching of it your great love and grace for a sinful people. And may we, according to the effectual power of your Spirit, respond with affirmation, with acceptance, with faith, and with following after you. Let me pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if I had to go back and choose a single day in my life that I looked forward to, with the greatest sense of anticipation and longing, that day would most certainly be my wedding day. From the earliest moments of dating Nancy, I I knew she was the one. I started looking forward to that day almost immediately. Once I decided to propose to Nancy, I tell you, I was looking forward to asking her to marry me. I planned and I plotted out the whole evening. I just couldn't wait to pop the question. And once we were engaged and the date was actually set, oh, I looked forward to our wedding day. I anticipated our life together with great joy and hope. And when the day came, it was a great day. I could still remember what she looked like as she came down the aisle. I was overwhelmed with her radiant beauty. I can remember the joyful, bold, loud confidence with which she recited her vows. It almost took me off guard. I remember that by the end of the reception, I had been smiling so long and so hard my cheeks hurt. But even thinking about that made me laugh all the more. No, it was in so many ways the greatest of days, well worth the wait. And yet, as great as my anticipation was for my wedding day, I can imagine how some other folks I know might have actually looked forward to their wedding day with even greater anticipation than I did. Why do I say that? Well, for starters, my, my wedding day was a day that I, I always thought was coming. There was a sense of anticipation, to be sure, but also perhaps a sense of expectation. You see, I, 
I always expected that I would get married. And Nancy was the first girl that I ever seriously dated. And we had, I think you could say, kind of an easy courtship. No real hard conflict to speak of. No times when it was all teetering on the brink. No, I would go so far as to say there wasn't a single moment in our courtship where the relationship seemed in doubt. It progressed uh, almost in a canned way, kind of according to schedule. We started dating our junior year in college. We got engaged right before Christmas, senior year, and we were married the Saturday after graduation in May. And yet I know lots of folks for whom that wasn't the case. I know folks who passed through so much relational hardship on their way to marriage. There was so much pain and brokenness, so much sin and sadness that they had, they had given up hope that they were even worthy of a wedding day or that a wedding day was even possible. And yet, by God's grace, he worked healing and restoration in their lives, so much so that much to the surprise and awe of those involved, the wedding day did come. And great was the anticipation. And great was the rejoicing. I even know one couple who actually got divorced. They had given up all hope of reconciliation and marriage in their lives, and God then brought them back together, and they were married again. And they are married to this day. And if I go back to my case, you know, I have to admit that even though the waiting for marriage seemed interminable, the truth is Nancy and I were married at 22. We were young, really young. We didn't really have to wait that long. And yet I know others who waited decades and decades into their adult lives before they ever got married. One of my dear friends didn't get married until she was well advanced in years. I'm not sure how old because it wasn't okay to ask. But I tell you, it was long after she and everyone she knew had given up the thought that she would ever be a bride. But in the gentle providence of God, the wedding did come. After decades and decades and decades of anticipation, it finally came. Why am I talking about all this? Because what we have before us this morning is a text of anticipation. Anticipation of a great wedding day. And this wedding day, I tell you, it is not according to plan. This is a wedding that seems impossible. For there is just too much relational strain, too much unfaithfulness, too much brokenness, too much sin. And on top of all of that, there seems to be just too much waiting, too much time. We're not talking decades here. We're talking centuries. This is a wedding that we turn and say to one another, how can this be? And when will this wedding come? Well, whose wedding are we talking about? Well, if you're a believer this morning, we're talking about your wedding. We're talking about mine. We're talking about the marriage of the people of God to the Lord, the heavenly bridegroom. That's what's before us here in Hosea 2, 14 through 23. But before we jump into the details of this anticipated wedding day, we, we first have to look back. We need a quick reminder of the relational dynamics that are in play here. This look back is necessary because the first word in our text is, therefore. This therefore demands that we go back and see what took place before the text that is before us. And what has taken place is that God had joined himself to Israel. He had chosen Israel as his very own, not because they were the greatest of peoples or the most obedient. No, on the contrary. We're actually told in Joshua 24 that Abraham was from a family of idolaters when God called him. And we're told in Deuteronomy 7 and 9 that Israel was stubborn and stiff-necked from the very beginning. But even so, God chose them and he blessed them. 
He made them a great nation according to his promise. He redeemed them from bondage and slavery in Egypt. He gave them the gift of his word and his holy presence. He gave them a good and pleasant land. God yoked himself to Israel in every conceivable way so that they would be his God, they would be his people, and he would be their God. And yet, as we have seen in the past few weeks, Israel turned from the Lord and turn to other gods. Not just on one occasion, but over and over and over again. They worship the gods of the surrounding nations with detestable practices. They obeyed and utterly disregarded the word of the Lord, the commandments of God, and they did it all with arrogance, persecuting the prophets that God would send to them in order to call them back. And so now here in Hosea, God is sending Israel another prophet. And Hosea is preaching to Israel in word and in deed. In his deeds, Hosea has, according to God's command, taken the very broken and sinful Gomer as his wife. As a living picture of God's relationship with the broken and sinful and unfaithful Israel. And Gomer, as we have seen, has played the literal whore, just as Israel has played the spiritual whore. She's gone after other lovers. She's born children to other men. And now, out of the brokenness of his personal life, Hosea must declare the word of the Lord to Israel. He must declare this word to what seems to be a hopelessly broken people. And as we have seen over the last few weeks, his words are hard. Israel, he declares, is a spiritual whore. And unto her, God will no longer show mercy. He will no longer consider Israel to be his people. In love, he has pleaded with her. In love, he has warned her. And now... Hosea declares, in jealous love, he will punish and discipline Israel to her absolute breaking point. He will take away all her economic, political, and military security. He will destroy the nation of Israel as a kingdom before him. As we look back towards the beginning of chapter 2, we see that there is this great therefore in verse 6, and then there are subsequent words of discipline and judgment. There is a great therefore in verse 9 with subsequent words of harsh judgment. This then is the rocky relationship between Israel and the Lord. This, it would seem, is a bad, bad breakup with no hope of reconciliation. Which then makes the therefore in verse 14... And all the verses that flow from it, shocking to say the least. For what proceeds from the verse 14, therefore, are a series of verses that are all organized around the literary marker of that day. You see it in verse 16, in that day. Again, in verse 18, on that day. And then in verse 21, and on that day. Now, they're all referring to one and the same day. It's the coming day when Israel and the Lord will be joined together in faithful spiritual matrimony. But what we see is that each of these that day references, they they all focus on or draw out different aspects of that day. Different aspects of this great spiritual wedding that will take place between God and his people. And so this morning, I would like us to consider each of these that day clusters, all three of them. The first we have in verses 14 through 17, and I've entitled it, The Effectual Proposal of the Glorious God. See, God knows that Israel has forgotten him and deserted him. We see as much in verse 13. And yet, out of the ashes of this relational devastation, God says, Therefore, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. I will speak tenderly to her 
And I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Accor a door of hope. The valley of Accor uh, was a place back in Joshua 7 where Israel committed great sin and rebellion and God enacted a great judgment. And what God is saying here is, I'm going to go right to that place, right to the place of your sin, your rebellion, your judgment, and there I will usher you into hope and joy. And he goes on, there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as, as at the time when she came out of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. No longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered no more. The first thing that we must see here is that all the initiative behind that day is with the Lord. He has pleaded with Israel through her brothers and sisters. He has warned Israel. He has punished Israel. And now he promises the day is coming when he will allure Israel. When he will speak tenderly to her in the wilderness. The wilderness, some of you may know, throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament is a place of devastation and judgment. And yet, it is also a place where again and again God meets with his people in their devastation and weakness. And here God is promising, even though he will punish Israel, even though he will drive her into the wilderness in exile and pain, there in the same wilderness he will speak words of love and grace and comfort to her. In essence, you might say, this is God tenderly proposing to Israel once again. Alluring, wooing, gently calling her to return to him. But what we see here is that this proposal is an effectual proposal. That is, it produces the very response that it calls for. In theology, we call this effectual calling. And what God is doing here, he is calling his people to himself in such a way that he produces the response he desires. God allures. God speaks tenderly. God gives blessings and Israel answers. This is not just kind of wishful thinking. This is not just kind of a a maybe sort of hope, but this is a necessary prophetic certainty. God will call out in gracious tenderness and with effectual power, and Israel will respond with the language of affection and faithfulness. God declares that Israel will purge the language of the Baals from her lips. The idols of the land will be remembered no more, and in their place they will call the Lord my husband. Israel will once again take refuge in the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Passover, the Exodus, the law, the promised land, and they will say to him in response to his tender speech to them, my husband, my husband. They will declare, I've been nothing but unfaithful to you. I deserve nothing but your wrath and judgment and condemnation, yet you speak to me with words of grace, words of forgiveness. You propose to me anew with words of tenderness, and in sovereign grace you melt my heart, and you compel me to say, I do, I will, I will return to you, we will be your people. And you will be our God. And why does this happen? Because of the grace of the Lord. As we already sang, he moved my soul to seek him seeking me. It was not I who found my Savior true. No, I was found by thee. What a day. And when this day comes... It will not merely be the case of God making a proposal that is graciously accepted. 
But the gracious God who speaks tenderly to Israel and induces her to cry out, my husband, then promises that he will enter into a formal covenant with Israel. Essentially, he is declaring a renewed covenant of marriage with his people. We pick this up in verse 18. For I will make for them a covenant on that day. And as we see in verses 18 through 21, this covenant has uh, three aspects. It's a covenant on one hand with the beasts and the birds and the creeping things. That's kind of strange. Second, it's a promise to abolish war in the land. And finally, it involves a marital betrothal between the Lord and Israel. Now, these three aspects are all connected. And they're not only connected in this passage, but they are connected throughout the Scriptures. In fact, if we go all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2, we see that when God created humanity, he blessed them in every aspect of their life. They had right relationship with God, right relationship with one another, and they had a right relationship with the creation. All creatures great and small, and even the ground on which they walked. And all of this rightness was conditioned on walking with the Lord, walking with him in perfect obedience. But we see in Genesis 3 that when Adam and Eve sinned, every part of this blessing was cursed. Humanity's relationship with God was cursed and broken. Humanity's relationship with one another was cursed and broken. And humanity's relationship with the creation was cursed and broken. Sin and death came to reign and rule throughout the created order. And God's plan has always been to redeem his people to reconcile them to himself and to restore, to make new the fullness of his blessing. So that when God chooses and blesses Israel, when he brings them out of Egypt and into the promised land, he promises that if they will hold fast to his word, he will bless them in rich and complete ways, ways that echo the blessings of the Garden of Eden. In Leviticus 26, for instance, God promises Israel that if they will walk in the Lord's statutes and observe his commandments, he will give them grain and wine in the promised land. They will dwell securely, free from the sword and the attacks of their enemies, and the Lord will remove harmful beasts from the land, and they will revere and worship the Lord. It is like a picture of Eden restored. However, just like Adam and Eve disobeyed, As we've seen, Israel disobeyed. And in their disobedience, all the potential blessings of Leviticus 26 were taken away from Israel. That's the judgment that is now coming upon Israel in Hosea's own prophetic word. But what we see is that even in the midst of that judgment, here and in many other places in the Old Testament, God is promising that in spite of all Israel's sin, he's promising to make a new covenant with his people, a covenant in which he not only promises them blessings for obedience, which he's done before, but now in a new way he is promising to effectually produce the faith and obedience that he calls for. And he's promising to betroth Israel to himself, as he says here, forever. It's a betrothal in righteousness and justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. And the Lord says, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And and you see here, this spiritual marriage to the Lord, this new covenant, it not only brings about right relationship with God, but it also then brings the holistic blessings of right relationship with the creation and with one another. That's the reason why this covenant is not only made with Israel, but with with the beasts. And and there's a promise of peace and, and violence being purged from the land. This is the message that we see over and over again in the prophets. We see this coming together of the great themes of covenant marriage with God which then produces peace between men and women and harmony with creation. One way of saying this is this is the kingdom of God. I wish we had time to look at all the passages throughout the Old Testament which expound these themes and bring them together, but 
Consider just a couple. One we've already read, Jeremiah 31, which speaks of God's God as Israel's husband who will create a new covenant in which all of God's people will know the Lord. Or consider then Ezekiel 34, in which the Lord promises to seek out the lost sheep of Israel, shepherd them himself, and enter into a covenant of peace with them, in which he banishes wild beasts from the land, drives out their enemies, makes them dwell secure, and enables all of God's people to know that I am the Lord their God, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people. They are the sheep of my pasture. And I am their God. That's Ezekiel 34. Or we could consider the multiple passages in Isaiah that speak about the coming kingdom being a place in which the Lord will make the lion lay down with the lamb. He will beat their swords into plowshares. And they will know, as we said this morning, that the Lord, their maker, is their husband. You see, here the Lord is not just promising to propose to his people with tender allurement in the wilderness. And he's not even just promising to produce Israel's acceptance to that proposal so that they declare my husband. But he's promising to enter into a formal, renewed covenant of marriage in which he leads Israel into marriage with himself, in which both parties come together in righteousness, justice, steadfast love, mercy, faithfulness, and knowledge. And then through that, they experience peace with one another and peace with creation. It's remarkable. And why does he do this? Why does he do this in spite of all of Israel's sin and spiritual whoredom and idolatry and immorality and injustice? Because his grace is truly amazing. His grace is greater than all our sin. The love of God is indeed strong and true, eternal and yet ever new. And so we say to one another, oh, what a day. Oh, in that day. Oh, on that day. But there's still more. (laughs) For on that day, we see that 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 day is, uh, is not just a day of proposal and acceptance. It's not just a day of covenant union, but it is a day of pronouncement and celebration in a way that goes beyond our wildest imaginations. We see this in the final three verses of the passage. In that Day, the Lord says, I will answer. And this divine answer, then you see, triggers a whole lot of answering. (laughs) It says the Lord will answer the heavens, the heavens will answer the earth, the earth will answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they, they shall all answer Jezreel, which means the Lord has sown. (laughs) The Lord will sow her, that is Israel, for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. And we ask, well, what's going on here with all this answering and saying? I think this is like the moment in the wedding ceremony in which the minister declares, I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. And everyone just starts clapping and cheering. This great pronouncement compels the witnesses to answer, Amen! (laughs) And here it seems, the language is a little odd, but it seems that the Lord is proposing to Israel. She is accepting The Lord is joining himself to Israel in covenant marriage, and he is now pronouncing this betrothal to be official. And all of creation is answering with praise and rejoicing. The chorus of creation bears joyful and abundant witness to the faithful, righteous, just, loving, merciful betrothal of God to his people. All is made right with the world. The heavens, the earth, the grain, the wine, they're all answering what God has sown and declaring their amen. God is saying here to sinful Israel, You turned on me. 
You forgot me. You forsook me. You were unfaithful to me in every conceivable way, so much that I had to rename you. Lo Ruhama, no mercy. Lo Ami, not my people. And it doesn't get any worse than that. But now, God is saying to Israel, not because of anything you have done, but simply because of my great love for you, I declare, I will have mercy on no mercy. I will say to not my people, you are my people. I will allure you, I will speak tenderly to you, and I will produce a faithful response in you. I will make a spiritual covenant of marriage with you. You will, in fact, know me, and you will be mine, and I will be yours. You will be right with me, you will be right with one another, you will be right with creation, and all of creation will rejoice and answer and sing over the marvelous saving work that the Lord has done among his people. This is the impossible marriage actually coming to be. That which was hopelessly broken beyond all repair being restored. This is a picture of joy unspeakable, hope unquenchable. But of course, that raises one last set of questions, right? When? How? I mean, when will that day be? When will it take place? How will it come about? This was a question that plagued the people of God throughout the rest of the Old Testament. We see glimpses of it uh, in the return from exile, but certainly nothing complete or satisfying like this passage testifies to. We ask, when, where, how? When is this great proposal coming, this, this covenant marriage renewal, this cosmic celebration the Old Testament draws to a close, and it really has not come. We enter into a period of waiting, longing, anticipation, waiting for that day, centuries upon centuries. And then along comes a carpenter from Nazareth. He gives himself various titles. Son of man, his name, of course, is Jesus. Many call him the Christ. But one of the titles with which he refers to himself is the bridegroom. He says that he himself is the bridegroom. The bridegroom of whom? It is no particular woman. It is the people of Israel themselves, the very people of God. And what we see in the life of Jesus is this bridegroom. He speaks with a tenderness to lost sinners like we have not seen before. And and in fact, there is a particular tenderness for, for women who have been caught in sexual sin. And this tender bridegroom who speaks tenderly to Israel and woos them to himself. He then sits down with his disciples and offers them a new covenant in his blood. Connections starting to come together. Then this Jesus, he dies on the cross for the sins of his people, the sins of Israel, and and John says in 1 John, for the sins of the whole world. And he's raised from the dead triumphant over sin and death, and Jesus now stands and offers himself as king, yes, as, as, as priest, as lamb of God, yes, but also as heavenly bridegroom for the people of God, with the invitation that all who will repent and believe in him and follow him in faith He receives them as the very bride of Christ. And this is not just an invitation for the ethnic people of Israel. It's actually an invitation for the whole world, 
for all those who are not God's people. He says, through me, you may be the very people of God. And he woos, he speaks tenderly, and in his grace he now produces and is producing throughout the nations an effectual response of faith and obedience as he is gathering to himself people from all the nations. He, the, the bridegroom has come. The, 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 the joining is taking place. But you say to yourself, that's really good, but where's this kind of cosmic celebration? All things made new. Well, the, for that, we have to go to the very end of the Bible, in which the Scripture says that this Jesus who came, who died, who, who rose, who ascended into heaven, he is coming again. And when he comes again, he will consummate this marriage in all fullness and in all beauty. The Scripture says he will make all things new and he will establish his table which will be a gathering of the nations to take part in the wedding supper of the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, men and women, I want to say to you, if, if if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're missing out on the greatest love ever known, the greatest grace, the greatest tenderness, a, a, a love that is beautiful and whole now, but it will be consummated in all of eternity with cosmic celebration forever. If you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I would implore you to listen to the tender calling of the Lord and to come to believe in him, to be joined to him in the great marriage of God and his people. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, th then we need to live this day with the knowledge that the bridegroom has come and the bridegroom is coming so that we look forward, we live all of our lives now with the anticipation of that day, the consummation of all things, all things being made new, the wedding supper of the Lamb, and we live as a people who have hope and a people who have love and grace to extend to the world, as a people who can endure under trial and affliction because we are beloved and treasured by the heavenly bridegroom and we will be safe and secure for all eternity. Martin Luther said that there were only two days on the Christian calendar. There was this day, and there's that day. And I pray that God will enable us to treasure the hopeful promises of his word, that we will hold fast to Jesus in faith, and we will live our whole lives this day with a firm grasp and expectation and anticipation of that day. And that will make all the difference. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we do pray. We pray that you would Woo us to yourself. Bring prodigals and stray and unfaithful people such as us home. Gather all the nations in that we may celebrate and rest in your grace and look forward to the consummation of all things, all things being made new and the glorious celebration of celebrations, the wedding feast of the Lamb. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.